Hello, good afternoon. We welcome you once again to the studios. Uh, right now we have uh, two more sessions to go. These two sessions uh, relate to the course uh, MS91 that is uh, Advanced uh, Strategic Management. The first uh, session we are going to cover uh, on corporate strategy. Uh, this uh, session will start uh, start from t uh, now, then uh, it will last up to, uh, it will go on up to 3.15. Then we have other session which is uh, starting at uh, 3.30 to 415. Uh, let's begin with uh, corporate strategy. Uh, we are mainly going to discuss uh, the concept of uh, corporate strategy. What is its nature and uh, significance? Uh, what are the various components and uh, functions of corporate strategy? And uh, finally, we'll uh, see what are the limitations of this corporate strategy. Uh, today, we have uh, Professor uh, K. Shankaran as a resource person. Professor Shankaran is uh, teaching at uh, International Management Institute, New Delhi. Uh, I welcome Professor Venk uh, Shankaran to our uh, studios. Thank you. Uh, Professor Shankaran, you may please take okay. the session. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Subhayama has told you about uh, the topics that are going to be covered uh, today uh, under corporate strategy. So let me just talk to you first about uh, uh, what strategy is. Let's start with uh, strategy itself. Um, now, we're saying that strategy is the direction and scope of an organization over the long run, which achieves advantage in a changing environment through its configuration of resources and competencies with the aim of fulfilling stakeholder expectations. Now, the main point here is that strategy is about the direction, it takes into account the resources of the company. It takes into account the environment of the company. And it's essentially trying to have advantage over the uh, environmental factors that the firm faces. Okay, let's uh, look at how strategy is different from uh, operational uh, uh, environment. So strategic management is different from operational management. Very quickly, we are going through this just to give a sense of uh, uh, context, just to say where we are, and then we'll start with main corporate strategy. Now, when we talk about strategic management, we are talking about uh, organization-wide holistic decisions, as opposed to op operational management where they are routinized. We are essentially talking about conceptualization of issues rather than simply techniques and uh, actions. Well, all these conceptualizations eventually lead to uh, actions, uh, creating new directions for the company. That is, in case the company is going in a certain way, how do you uh, change the direction and uh, get company onto a different path? That is what you, you are looking at uh, in strategic management, as opposed to managing existing resources and existing uh, ways of doing things. Uh, we are trying to develop uh, new resources, uh, while when you are talking about operational management, we are talking about operating within existing strategy and existing uh, constraints of uh, resources. Uh, strategic management decisions are always ambiguous and uncertain. Uh, these are all problematic situations in the sense that uh, when you take decisions, there is no exact uh, uh, certainty as to how things are going to pan out, as opposed to operational management where by and large you would know uh, what's going to be the outcome more or less uh, clearly. They are long term in nature and uh, operational decisions are of a day to day uh, nature. Now having said that, let us look at uh, again one last slide as to what are the building blocks of uh, uh, building blocks of uh, strategy. Now you know it's very interesting to look at uh, a company and say what is the company doing? Why is it there? And wh where is it at present right now? And what should it do? And how and where and what and who, etc., etc. All these questions, the seven questions that you can see on the left side, the first column there, all these are addressed by the issues of strategy. So if you look at the why, essentially you're talking about purpose, mission, vision, you know, it could be called a credo could be called principles, company principles, values, beliefs, and so on. And the next one is where, 
essentially you are addressing the question of context. You know, when you talk about context, uh, we are talking about environmental analysis, uh, pest analysis, and uh, industry analysis and so on. I'm not going to go into the depth here because you would have covered this under some other uh, heading. Uh, we are essentially looking at uh, the corporate strategy, which is what the company should do. Uh, and uh, you know, it can be divided into corporate strategy, business strategy, and functional strategies. And how, who, and when, these are issues of implementation. Now, uh, essentially a company uh, looks like this, a multi-business organization looks like this, with a corporate parent right at the top, and uh, you'll have several divisions and uh, businesses below those uh, divisions. Now, if you look at this, uh, we are essentially talking about a modern organization with uh, presence in various businesses. When we talk about a business, we are talking about uh, one product market segment that the company would be covering. Now, let's look at the uh, next uh, slide here. Uh, well, as I said earlier, there are three levels of strategy. We are talking about corporate strategy, business strategy, and functional strategy. And uh, today our interest is in uh, uh, functional strategy. No, uh, excuse me, corporate strategy. So when you talk about corporate strategy, uh, we are essentially talking about uh, three important points. This is important because this really is the is the breadth of corporate strategy issues. Now, the first is the rationale for the portfolio of companies. See, so earlier we said that uh, you have a center for the enterprise. Under this center, you have several businesses. And uh, so what is the rationale for the portfolio of businesses that the company is, uh, well, the, 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 the organization has? Okay. Now, so what businesses to be in and their characteristics? Now, essentially, this is about some kind of a rationalization of the portfolio. And uh, we will essentially be talking about uh, uh, matrix management of uh, the portfolio or we would be talking about uh, core competency. These are two opposing uh, ideas uh, and uh, both equally uh, popular in their own right at different points in time. So we'll look at this. Um, that is the first point, the rationale and the portfolio rationalization of the businesses which come under this corporate umbrella. So if, if you have to take an example, we would say, okay, why, if you are talking about the Tata Enterprise, why would Tata be in uh, Tata Steel? Why should it, it be in steel? Why should it be in uh, um, automotive engineering? And why should it not be in uh, some, uh, let's say, in oil, uh, Tata Oil divested, right? So uh, this is essentially about including or excluding certain businesses from your portfolio. The second issue is about uh, growth. Uh, what are the kind of uh, decision, what are the kinds of decisions that you take to be or not be in certain businesses? So essentially we are talk talking about mergers and acquisitions uh, or greenfield projects. In other words, means of getting to the kind of portfolio that was uh, discussed in point number one. Third is about managing the businesses. Now if you have a corporate uh, parent, that is the center that we talked about earlier. If you go back to the previous slide, uh, what is the kind of relationship, what is the kind of support that this uh, top management, that is the center, that is the corporate uh, uh, group, would give to individual businesses? So this is the issue that uh, we would be looking at. And how do companies see their role? How, how does the corporate uh, uh, apex, if I may, uh, see its role in uh, giving certain support to the various businesses. That is going to be the third point that we'll be discussing. Now, for the most part, our discussion will center around uh, the first one, and we'll top this with a couple of slides for the last two points that we have raised here. So let us look at the first one, the rationale for the portfolio. Now, if you look at this, what business to be in and their characteristics, now, if you look at, I talked about uh, the Tata. Now, there's this famous uh, General Electric. Uh, you know, 
what they said was, they told the business heads that if you have to be in this G family, you have to be number one or two in terms of your presence in the market and you have to give very superior return on investment. A certain amount to specify, and uh, that had to be uh, that, that had to be the return that the business would give the parent organization. Um, Tata is also the similar kind of decision was made in 1991 when uh, Ratan Tata came in uh, to head the Tata Empire. They said we are going to be in seven core areas, and these seven core areas were defined, and uh, I'd like to just show you those uh, seven core areas, those are, uh, you will see it's uh, engineering, uh, materials, energy, chemicals, consumer products, communication and IT and services. Okay. Now whatever was outside this, uh, whether it was Tomco or some other company was electronics, you know, some of the electronic companies were divested based on not fitting into this and uh, you will find that uh, the illustrative list of companies here also given you find I don't want to read out these you have it right in front of you these are the companies that would es essentially fall under the various sectors that are mentioned here now if you go to the next uh, slide we will find that uh, well uh, portfolio analysis is essentially based on this that is each business has different financial characteristics they offer different strategic options. So if you are talking about a portfolio uh, approach, we are saying that each of these units within the portfolio has a certain characteristic which is uh, uh, in its own right different from the rest and uh, the rationale for being a separate unit is strong in terms of offering a separate product uh, uh, or being in a different product market segment than the rest of the uh, products that the company has. So this business is going to be a separate strategic business unit. That is the common term that's used. So uh, corporate strategy is about deciding what strategic business units to be in. Uh, having said that, they are different in their financial characteristics. They are different in terms of uh, the product markets that they serve. You need to examine them separately. You know, there is uh, no point putting them all together into one basket and looking at the aggregate performance because it makes eminent sense to separate out each of these businesses and look at each business separately and see whether it's doing its job properly in terms of giving proper returns, in terms of having adequate market share, in terms of adding value to customers, adding value to the various stakeholders including of course the shareholder. So the only extent of tie-up between the businesses uh, would be, you know, a cash flow that is at the end the cash flow is aggregated the transfer depends upon whether the recipient is designed for market share expansion that is those uh, businesses which are looking at expansion and which is looking for cash would be given money by the uh, enterprise uh, that is the apex organization that is the corporate office uh, would give these businesses uh, resources for expansion uh, so there is there is some amount of uh, dependence certainly, but only at the level where you're talking about key decisions like financial uh, uh, capital uh, uh, investments and uh, the kind of money required for large investments and so on. Uh, there are two considerations which you would normally look at if you are looking at what portfolio to be in. You are going to look at two factors. One is growth of the business and the other is relative market share. Now when we talk about the growth of the business, we are saying that growth of the business is really a surrogate for the prospects of the company. That is, uh, if the growth is high, it means that this particular industry is uh, attractive. So there is a certain amount of assumption here, that is attractiveness is equated with growth and uh, the other factor is relative market share. If the relative market share of the company, that is of the business rather, is good, it's better to retain it because it has got an inherent uh, uh, strength and you don't want to lose that strength. So higher market share means you have an advantage and you want to retain that advantage. So these are two factors, that is the growth of the business 
and relative market share of the business of the enterprise. These are two factors that are usually taken into account to decide whether the company should be retaining this particular business or not. Now this whole approach was pioneered by uh, uh, Boston Consulting Group which came up with what is called a BCG matrix where they uh, said okay take a company look at the various members that is member businesses of the company and uh, classify them according to these two dimensions that is business growth and relative competitive position. Now if you look at these and uh, uh, classify them according to whether the business growth is good that is high or it's low that is high or low compared to the growth of the economy for instance or growth of the industrial sector however uh, in whichever manner you want to classify it. Uh, now you map this against relative competitive position call them high and low uh, you would say relative competitive position is high when market share is high and uh, it's low when market share is low then you have these four quadrants these four quadrants are uh, euphemistically or very interestingly called stars cash cow question mark and dogs now what stars are is your business growth rate is high and relative uh, market share is also high in other words it's really a very desirable to think have a few stars in your portfolio which means that they will continue to grow and then it's expected that they would continue to be strong in their own uh, businesses in their own positions in which case you are expected to have better returns to all the stakeholders. Now when business growth rate is uh, high but uh, relative competitive position is low in other words there are competitors who are uh, better, than, better off than you in which case it's a question mark if you, should you retain these portfolios or not. If you decide to retain them they will absorb a certain amount of cash uh, likely to be very high levels of cash for capital investment so that they can effectively compete with stronger competitors in future. A cash cow is one where you have relative high competitive position but growth is not so good. So it's in, in the product life cycle it's at the uh, plateauing stage or it is at the declining stage. So it's a cash cow because it's likely that uh, it's giving you good returns but you don't want to invest in these businesses. So it gives you money but uh, it is not likely to be good to invest in these businesses because they are probably uh, low growth, in fact not probably, they are low growth industries and probably after a few years they may even be out, it's these products are in the uh, declining stage of the product life cycle. The last one dogs are uh, essentially you have low business growth rate and you have low competitive position. These are absolute no no, you don't want to keep them and ideally if you get a reasonable reasonably good price you might even like to divest given the loss of the land for divestment and uh, spinning off and so on. So this is what BCG matrix is about and let's quickly look at what are the different kind of strategies that you would have for these uh, four of for these uh, uh, four different uh, categories. Now what you have is for cash cow you will insist on high profitability, least capital spending and tight financial control for cost leadership. So low cost, low investment, high profitability strategy. For stars you will have, you will plow back returns towards capital spending to maintain share bill for future. In other words here you will spend on capital assets. Question marks are identify which would become stars. Some of these question marks might become stars. Identify those and which would become dogs and play the way you think is appropriate. In other words future stars you would like to retain and future dogs you would like to divest. And dogs are no capital spending, be aware of any loss, um, any cross subsidy. In other words your, your business probably is running at a loss because of cross subsidies you may not even be knowing that this is happening. So look at any kind of cross subsidies that you are doing that somebody else, some other business is making money and these guys are enjoying it without uh, you knowing it because of the quirks of uh, accounting. So insist on minimum returns here and look for the earliest opportunity to spin it off. 
Okay. Um, well, this is uh, the, th those are the you know independent decision that you would like to have or, or for each of these uh, different uh, business units. Uh, corporate strategy evolves separate business strategies for each business at an overall level. Try evolving mixed towards having big cash cows and having the stars who will in turn become cash cows in future, assuming that product life cycle would uh, hold and uh, your uh, stars would become cows at some time. And similarly, you have uh, question marks that will turn out to be stars at some later date. So don't just divest all question marks. Look at some potential areas and keep them and nurture them so that eventually they become your stars. And divest selected question marks and dogs when opportunity arises. And keep a healthy mix with the eye on the future. So this is at this this came at a time historically it came at a time when companies were going for conglomerate diversification and they used to have a plethora of uh, businesses under them and uh, there was no tool available at that time to see what should be the ideal mix of portfolios. So we have to take it in that historical context. It may not be so relevant uh, today as it used to be during early 70s or late 70s, you know, even sometime early 80s. So let's look at uh, some of the advantages of BCG metrics. Tells what to do at different with business different businesses. Allows for tracking changes. Sends a message that differential performance of businesses can only be expected. In other words, stars you would expect their returns to be slightly less because most of the money would be used for uh, uh, spending on capital expenditure, while cash cows you would expect high returns, and it's only expected. And it also allows for a certain amount of balance in terms of cash flow management. And uh, disadvantage of BCG metrics is it tells you what to do with existing businesses. It does not tell you what to acquire. That is, you are essentially dealing with all those different businesses you have currently, but it doesn't tell you what to acquire. It ignores synergy. That is, between two businesses, if there is some uh, synergy. In other words, these two businesses together is performing better than they would as uh, if they were to be alone is not taken into account if you have uh, when you use this particular technique it does not take into account the need for balancing the portfolio and diversifying risk in other words risk is not a factor that is taken into account by bcg metrics that's very evident since the two axes that you use are not taking into account the risk part okay you can do some modifications that's what people have done uh, when looking at certain locations like map potential companies that could be acquired, develop a separate metrics that shows how businesses are dependent upon each other, that is, that would take into account synergy, ask whether balancing is one of the objectives, if yes, connect up these businesses like above. In other words, you could have business, uh, well, Boston Consulting Group metrics say that well, two businesses go together, you could have some complex analysis of that sort by uh, incorporating uh, certain um, connections between various businesses. Let's look at the next big wave that came up in corporate strategy uh, with respect to what kind of businesses the enterprise should be in. And uh, this is ascribed to um, CK Prahla, talked about co-competence. Co he said, don't look at these businesses as separate port portfolios, but look at what can, uh, what can be done if these businesses are together to do some you know, high-tech uh, work uh, or some offer some uh, something uh, some which they you know with, with a certain kind of competency which cannot be done by somebody else so he called it co-competence so he was saying that well uh, you need to restructure and declutter the various businesses identify cultivate and exploit core competencies we'll come to what core competencies are very soon exploit the market and power of collective learning to provide consumer with higher service. So essentially the, the, the emphasis over here in co-competence is on learning and uh, uh, secondly on uh, the kind of value that is delivered to the <coughs> customer. Now look at this diagram over here you have four levels. Uh, at the first level, at the bottom level is a certain amount of competence. This competence is something which is sometimes not easily describable, it is intangible and based on this competence you may have certain co-products, we'll come to some examples, that's the best way to uh, illustrate this 
and then you have certain businesses and you have certain products coming out of those businesses and if you see let's take an example that's the way as I said to best uh, describe this you will find that uh, well a global company like 3M uh, you will find their competencies let's start from the bottom their competencies is substrate material that is the material which uh, is uh, used for any kind uh, you know which is used as a surface for coating so when you see a, s a cello tape for instance the substrate material is the transparent film on which comes a certain kind of um, adhesive so their competence is in substrate material of course adhesive material and the coating technology if you see core products are surface coated material so you find a large number of products the SKU is under uh, 3M's uh, hat is several hundred uh, close to thousand now these all these SKUs you will find have a common feature in terms of being a surface coated material so the core product is surf surface coated material businesses are office stationary industrial edifices and you will find end products are posted notes magnetic tape photographic film so something as simple as uh, well it's very complex production wise and marketing wise but at the end I use this for something as simple as sticking two uh, sheets of paper together um, or a post-it note to drive home a point uh, you put a post-it note over a piece of paper all this have surface coated materials and the competency of the company is in substrate material and uh, uh, coating technology and uh, the adhesive uh, chemistry similarly if you look at uh, Honda another uh, great company uh, you will find that uh, their uh, uh, competence is in internal combustion engines which is what we have in cars um, buses or their material technology coatings multi-fuel systems now if you see this you find that their core products are petrol engine well uh, and small size diesel engines and transmission assembly now with petrol engine as their core product you will find that they have been in automobiles and small generators uh, power generators uh, so you will find that in fact uh, Honda was not an automobile company to start with it used to make uh, generators they used to make the best generators in the world and they thought okay now we have this ability to make generators why not use this technology why not use this ability to make cars that's how they got into cars and made a huge success of being in cars so what co-competence is saying what this idea is saying is that instead of looking at portfolio of businesses in terms of uh, uh, different uh, product market positions why not look at a whole range of products based on some competence co-competence which could be in technology which could be in servicing which could be in marketing abilities but all these strengths should be uh, across a wide variety of markets in other words the strength that you have should be able to cater or generate products which can go across various uh, markets and co-competence should provide significant contribution to the perceived customer benefits in other words it should not be a trivial competence uh, it should be able to provide some superior value to customers and co-competence should be difficult for customer well it's not customer for competitor to imitate in other words it should be sustainable for the company so that the competitor is not able to imitate this product so these three factors have to be satisfied before you can say that the company has co-competence one it should be available widely across various, various markets second it should be providing significant contribution to the perceived customer benefits and third it should not be easily uh, imitatable by uh, competitors okay so what we discussed so far is about rationalizing the portfolio of businesses under the corporate umbrella we said there are two broad ways of doing this one is if if there are a large number of businesses which which are very very different 
the first stage would would be would probably be looking at it from a BCG angle and say that well this has gone too far and there are too many businesses too far flung businesses we need to rationalize them in which case you uh, divide them into four categories uh, called stars question marks um, dogs and uh, we called uh, whatever we call that something else all the four different categories that we had cows the uh, cash cow that is the fourth one and uh, have a certain mix of these so that there is the right mix of cash cows and stars and question marks some of the question marks you, you have to see what to do with them um, see whether they're going to become stars in which case you retain them you'd like to retain them and dogs you would like to get rid of or divest if of course you know there is enough exit options available to the company which is now uh, provided by the law to much greater extent it used to be earlier in our country now the next way to look at this whole thing is well instead of looking at these businesses as disparate and different uh, businesses you have to see as to whether there is some common thread running across these businesses in terms of uh, some core competency and uh, the advantage of core competency is if you can identify it well then it's probable that you can identify some new products and markets which you haven't thought about because now you understand your real core competence and you start looking for opportunities and you start saying oh I have this competence and I can serve this product market segment effectively yeah uh, to say that something is a core competence is not easy it is uh, it has to be based on sound judgment we came with these three factors which would actually uh, qualify a certain core competency to be um, genuinely uh, defined as core competency we said that it should provide some significant benefit to your customer it should not be easily uh, copyable by your competitors and it should be available to a wide variety of products and markets in which you would like to be in you are already in or you would like to be in ok if you go back uh, the second point that this is the first point that is rationalization of uh, 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 portfolio the next we said is important point in corporate strategy is means of growth now when you talk about the means of growth we are saying that uh, there are various kinds of growth strategies how do we get to the state that you would like to be in okay initially we are looking at the businesses as such what you want to be in what you don't want to be in but how do we get there there are so many different ways of getting there uh, it could be through a greenfield project which means that you are going to set it up all by yourself or through mergers and acquisitions now if you see the first column in the uh, slide you will find that growth strategy is defined as greenfield then you have several different kinds of uh, mergers and acquisitions M&A is uh, mergers and acquisitions you have horizontal diversi uh, horizontal mergers and acquisitions vertical related unrelated and uh, long term contracts now this is just to say uh, this particular slide or PowerPoint presentation is to say what is going to be the result of the merger and acquisition given that you're going to have a certain kind of growth strategy so you are going to have greater market share uh, through horizontal mergers and acquisitions and greenfield projects maybe greenfield projects also could, give, could be vertically integrated vertically integrated strategy as you would have already known uh, as you already know uh, is about uh, going vertically up meaning you start taking control over your uh, suppliers material and otherwise you backward integrate or forward integrate in which case you are going to along the value chain on the forward side and going ahead and taking over a company or going for greenfield expansion so that you are delivering a more value added product to your customer and cut when you talk about corporate conglomerates we are talking about unrelated diversification being in different product market segments with no relationship uh, between one another um, you, you can have uh, uh, unrelated mergers and acquisition you could also have related M&A which is somewhat uh, it's, it's actually technically it is between conglomerate diversification and related uh, well uh, um, uh, horizontal or vertical 
uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, so you have uh, corporate conglomerates uh, coming out of this kind of uh, growth strategy. Now, uh, the advantages are this. If you talk about horizontal uh, mergers and acquisitions, you will have large production days. Uh, you will be able to share common facilities and market positioning. That means market positioning essentially market share. Higher market share means greater bargaining power vis a vis um, the customer, as Porto would uh, like to say, which is an issue that comes in competitive strategy. Um, vertical diversification means greater direct control on inputs and or outputs, depending upon whether you are backward integrating or forward integrating. And uh, related mergers and acquisitions, related diversification would be sharing of knowledge, market channels, etc. An example would be ITCs getting into biscuits, for instance, having a great uh, uh, network of uh, channels for selling cigarettes meant also that the same channels could be used for selling uh, eatables, for instance. And unrelated, product market different for various businesses. The rationale for unrelated diversification was essentially uh, being at different points on the business life business cycle. When business cycles go up and down, then you would like to be at different points so that you are essentially spreading your risk. Okay, now the next one. So this is the second point. That is after having said the rationale for uh, uh, the portfolio, we said what are the various ways of uh, uh, getting there, that is different kinds of mergers and acquisitions, different kinds of options that you have within mergers and acquisitions and so on. Next we said is going to be the parenting types. Okay. Now we will just, uh, uh, this is uh, probably the last slide, uh, we will look at uh, different kinds of uh, parenting styles. Yeah. If you see the first column, you will find that uh, uh, one is an entirely hands-off approach, entirely financial arrangement. All you're looking for is financial returns, and uh, the corporate office would bother the would bother the uh, businesses only uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know, financial returns. So pure financial returns, the descriptors would be ra corporate traders uh, willing to strip the assets of the company, company tradable in the market for corporate control. Uh, Private equity is a classic example. Okay, that is uh, entirely financial arrangement. Next is standalone businesses. Um, this is the concept spearheaded by GE, uh, separate business units, strategic business units, independent business level leadership, classic example would be GE. The next is linked businesses. Uh, uh, in, in this, the various businesses would be somewhat linked between the various businesses. So one purchase department of one particular um, uh, business would be sympathetic to sister concern. Uh, some of the Indian companies which are diversified actually have this kind of a structure like Reliance or Aditya Birla Group have this kind of a structure. And central functions, this is more or less the old style where you have a common functional department. Let's say the finance or the marketing department is common for all the different uh, businesses. In other words, the salesman is selling different products. There is no product specialization when it comes to sales, there is no product manager, there is no separate marketing for different uh, products and so on. So central functions, there is central function which takes into account all the uh, uh, functional uh, aspects of various businesses. That is the last one. So that is the third aspect, parenting style, uh, which is uh, an aspect of corporate strategy. Uh, so with that, uh, I stop here. Of uh, this corporate strategy session is over. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shankaran. Uh, you have very well explained how different is the corporate strategy from uh, uh, the operational strategy. Then you talked about the core issues in uh, corporate strategy that is uh, portfolio, rational for uh, portfolio, growth, and uh, relative how to retain the relative market share in the uh, business and the meaning of, uh, uh, sorry, managing the business, that is parent, uh, parent the business. Yes. Uh, you have uh, very well explained the BCG matrix as well to the students. Thank you for the lively presentation with the real examples. Thank you once again. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, the next session will uh, start exactly at uh, 3.30. Please uh, stay back.